It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the next speaker, Anthony Raffin. Anthony is a research, research engineer with the German um, Aerospace Science Center, DLR. His interest include robotics and reinforcement learning, and uh, he has been leading several open source projects focused on benchmarking robotic uh, reinforcement learning for robotics, including Stable Baseline 3 and RL Baseline 3 Zoo. Uh, these are projects that have hundreds of parts, uh, thousands of stars that have been used by thousands of researchers, myself included. And they are uh, one of, if not the go to re open source uh, resource implementation of uh, deeper enforcement learning algorithms. So I'm very eager to discover what he's about to present. Thank you very much for the introduction. So um, my talk is going to be at the intersection between software engineering and reinforcement learning. So let's start with a bit of motivation. Um, and, and the first thing I, I would like to, I mean, remind you if you don't know already about it, is that reinforcement learning is hard. So let's say you're trying to compare algorithm A and B. So here on the left, you've run several experiments for quite uh, some time. So here on uh, 10 million uh, time steps, and you're comparing the performance. And looking at the learning curve here, you would say that A should be better than B because um, it learns faster and it learn and it reaches a higher score than B. Uh, the truth is, and this is a real experiment, uh, A and B is the exact same algorithm, but it's even worse than that. It's the exact same code with the same hyperparameters. The only difference is it is the epsilon parameter, which is a value to avoid division by zero uh, in the optimizer. So normally this value is only meant to avoid division by zero, but here it has actually a great impact on the performance. So in RL, small details, and implementation can have great impact in performance. So you need to be extra careful when you implement and when you use uh, RL algorithms. And, and that's why actually I spent quite some time uh, trying to have reliable uh, implementation. So this is the outline of today. I'm going to present a bit, how do we manage to have reliable implementation using Stable Baseline 3? Um, then I will talk about a similar project, which is going together with Stable Baseline 3, which is the RL Zoo. Um, and I will talk about how do we make sure that we have reproducible experiments. And of course, everything that I'm presenting is using RL as an example, but I think it, it should be applicable to any uh, empirical science. Uh, I will then give some tips on implementing a new algorithm and finish with a technique that I'm using more and more, which is having a minimal implementation. I will also give some links for best practices for empirical uh, reinforcement learning. Um, so if you don't know already about it, Stable Beja 3 is a set of reliable reinforcement learning implementation. Uh, we provide many algorithms, many state-of-the-art algorithms, and all through uh, easy-to-use interface API, uh, so that in three lines of code, you can already declare uh, your agent, train it on the custom task, and then query it uh, quickly for um, action once it's trained. But the main thing about the library is we ensure that we provide reliable implementation. But why do I mean by reliable? So one thing, of course, is that we uh, benchmark our implementation and test them against published results. So we, we spent quite some time um, making sure that we can reproduce the result from original paper. Um, and, and we actually found some um, hidden tricks while doing so. We try also to follow software engineering best practices by having a high code coverage. So code coverage is um, the percentage of line of, of your code, which is covered by at least one test. Uh, we uh, type our code and check it statically here using MyPy. In terms of tests, we usually uh, decompose them into three types of tests. We have what I call run tests, which is just checking that the code runs without any error. It doesn't mean that it's doing what you want. We have unit tests, which is a um, much smaller test, but checking a specific feature and checking that the result is exactly what uh, we want and checking that uh, the small component is, is doing what is expected. And finally, and I will show an example in the next slide, we have performance test, which is not about runtime, but here about checking that the algorithm is optimizing something, is learning something, and is not uh, fully random. Of course, having a active community, so with more than 3 million downloads, um, make it, it extra reliable because if something is wrong, if something is not working properly, you can be sure that someone is going to complain. And in that case, we tend to uh, try to fix the problem quickly. 
we have a complete uh, documentation with many examples, uh, many tutorials and notebooks that you can try out online and our API is also fully documented. Uh, let's finish with a quick example of what do I mean by, for instance, doing a performance test. Let's say you would like to test PPO, so proximal policy optimization, which is one of the most used reinforcement learning algorithm out there. And you want to check that it's learning something in your test. So what do we do? We declare, we first define a small training budget. So we cap the maximum number of iteration and we set it to as small as possible. Um, and then we train it on a simple environment uh, using that budget. And after training, we evaluate it. And the test consists in checking that the performance reach for this small budget is above a given threshold. And if you do a tiny change in the algorithm, then it will maybe still learn something, but not reach any more of these thresholds. But so this is one way to check that we don't introduce any regression um, in our algorithm. And um, SB3 doesn't come alone. It comes actually with uh, three repositories. One is about having more algorithm, so it's SB3 contrib. One is about having fast implementation in JAX, so from 5 to 20 times faster than the PyTorch one. And then we have the RSO, which is uh, for everything which is about experiment. So Stable Business 3 is all about the basic components for RL algorithm and the algorithm. And the zoo is all about training, evaluating, but also plotting and having some uh, additional metrics. And the zoo is a key component for having reproducible experiment. But how do we do to have reproducible experiment? So the thing is, we lock everything that is needed automatically to reproduce and compare different runs. Um, the idea is to minimize the potential mistake uh, when you run uh, experiment by only letting you focus on your task and not on the different training script. So in practice, it provides you with training, loading, plotting script, and also automatic hyperparameter optimization. We have integration with weight pattern biases and hugging face. I will talk about that uh, a bit later. And we have more than 200 pre-trained models with tuned hyperparameters. So if you would like to apply um, your um, RL to a new problem, you can check out the hyperparameters to, uh, that worked on similar problems. Um, and finally, and I think it's relevant for this workshop, we have a full uh, benchmark of all of our algorithm on many different tasks. And this benchmark is fully open source and you can check out uh, every log. So how does it work in practice? In practice, let's say you would like to train an agent on a task, save checkpoints every um, 10,000 steps and also maybe do some uh, via some change in your task which for instance change the gravity um, and this is what you would do uh, so you would just call the train script specify the algorithms it specify the task specify the different um, the checkpoint frequency and how often do you want to evaluate it and then you can directly on the fly modify the hyperparameter or modify parameters of your simulation and, and the thing that the zoo do for you, and that would be actually valid for any uh, other run, um, it saves everything about this run to allow you to reproduce it. So you don't need to wonder what did I do in, in it? What did I change? Everything is saved. In practice, we have one folder per experiment and this folder contains so everything that you need to reproduce it. So it contains all the custom command line argument that you pass, it contains the hyperparameters of uh, your model. It may contain the normalization uh, statistics if there's some. It contains all the checkpoints and contains the evaluation results and, and, and the stats result like the episodic return. Um, the interesting thing is because all experiments are formatted the same way, it makes it easy to plot, compare, and also follow the best practices for comparison of the different algorithms. So here again, once you have do, did many runs, you can do with just one line in the terminal, um, uh, plot everything and compare everything uh, in a systematic way. And as I say, we have a benchmark all of our algorithm and all the log and results are available online. So what does that mean? That means that you can check out online, so here is on weight and biases, a group algorithm by whatever parameter you want, you can activate, deactivate them. 
you can take a look at indiv individual runs with all the different metrics that are logged. You can even have a look at the exact parameter that we use to run uh, to, to run the, the algorithm. But it's more importantly, it allows you to compare if you want to try out a variation of an algorithm, it allows you to compare it to it. And this is what we, we did actually very recently. So in gray, we have a PPO, which is a normal hyperparameter. And then we did a small variation, and I will talk about that uh, in, in the next section. We did a small variation on how we estimate the value, and then we checked uh, against uh, the, 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 the open RL benchmark that we have. And that way we can quickly see uh, from here that the value loss is much higher than uh, in the previous uh, runs. So this really allow you yeah, to, to compare and check everything and everything is, is uh, open. And uh, let's finish with some uh, robot videos. So every robot video that I will show today are uh, using stable baseline, the zoo, and uh, maybe Contrib or, or SBX. And here I was comparing, so um, how to learn fast, uh, how to walk with an elastic quadruped. And I'm comparing a uh, different level of prior knowledge. So on the left, you will have reinforcement learning from scratch, and then you will have some uh, prior knowledge using an open loop controller, here a central pattern generator. And, and then I tested different variation of uh, combining the open loop controller with RL, and then optimizing uh, everything online. Everything is done uh, here and learn on the real robot. And of course, the best result is uh, obtained when you optimize the open loop controller directly on the real robot and combining combine it with reinforcement learning. And, and here it's very important when you do a real robot experiment, ac actually, to, to have a reliable implementation and to have um, experiment that you can reproduce and, and you know how to continue, for instance, the, ex the experiment over uh, several days. Um, so I presented stable baseline three on how to have reliable implementation. I presented the zoo, uh, which is about reproducible experiment with training uh, evaluation and plotting and the different metrics. Uh, but now I would like to give you some tips on how to implement new algorithm. Those tips, I will use again RL as an example, but I, I think it's applicable to many fields. So what to do when you want to implement a new algorithm? One thing, of course, is to first read the original paper several times. Make sure to check out the appendix also. So here you have an example of the DeepQ network, so DQN. Um, and if you if you scroll down and, and go in, in one of the extended table of the appendix, then you realize that the, there's an important hyperparameter that is mentioned only there, um, that they only update the network every four uh, steps in the simulator. And, and this is the kind of details that is usually very important for either runtime or for performance, and that might be hidden or not so clearly written in the paper. So that's one thing. Another thing is, of course, to read if it exists, the existing uh, implementation, especially the original one, because sometimes, and that's especially the case for PPO, there's a lot of tricks, implementation details, which are mentioned, which are not mentioned in the paper, but present uh, in the code. As an example, PPO um, uses uh, GAE for uh, advantage estimation. So this is mentioned in the paper, but it also uses a TD Lambda estimator for the value function instead of a Monte Carlo estimator. And this, if you look at the core and you're not careful, you can uh, easily overlook. We have actually a blog post about the 37 implementation detail of PPO um, that is published at iClear uh, blog post track if you want to learn more about that. So once you have read the existing implementation and the paper, then what you should try to have is uh, have something that kind of work uh, on a simple problem. So trying to have some sign of life on toy problems. So why toy problems? Toy problems because uh, they are normally fast to run. You can also design them in a way that you check exactly uh, what your algorithm should solve and it make it easy to, to debug. And by sign of lime, I mean that your algorithm should do something that is not fully random. And here, as an example, I was checking that PPO with memory, so with a recurrent neural network here, PPO LSTM, was working. 
And the way I did it, I was checking on the pendulum environment. So the pendulum, you need to swing it up and then keep it upright. So what I did is I removed the velocity from the observation, which make it impossible for a normal PPU implementation to solve. So without memory, uh, because you need to know about the angular velocity to actually balance it properly. And that's what you see on the left. So PPO uh, without memory just fail on that simple task where uh, PPO with memory actually reaches the, the highest score that you, you can have on, on this problem. And iterating quickly on simple problem is very important because if you need one hour to know if your algorithm is working, you, you're never going to make it. The next thing I do usually is step-by-step -step validation. So of course, I, log, I try to log every useful uh, values that can tell me something about uh, the algorithm. As an example, I'm, I, I can log the mean and max Q value uh, or the um, explain variance. And then I usually use a debugger to step through the code and especially checks the different shape. Uh, because there's something um, in, in NumPy, which is called automatic broadcasting, where uh, if you add a vector to a matrix with a column, uh, with one column, you would expect yourself to have a vector at the end, but um, NumPy does some broadcasting and at the end you end up with a matrix. So this is an example of a bug where it runs. So it will be hard to debug because there's no real error, but it doesn't work. Uh, because it's not doing what you expect. And of course, uh, the last thing I do, and I would also highly recommend to do that, is to visualize what the train agent has learned. Because looking at the behavior learned usually tells you more about what is happening than just looking at some metrics or values in your term. And once I have so an algorithm that is looking not completely wrong, what I do is and I validate unknown environment. So um, Having an environment that you know allows you to quickly know what kind of behavior has been learned. If the behavior is the best, uh, is, is the optimal one, or if there's some problem, for instance, in exploration or some problem uh, somewhere else. And, and of course, start with simple problem, easy problem, and then go harder uh, in towards harder and harder problem. And usually when you finished um, benchmarking your implementation, on, on the hardest problem that you know, then you can be sure that uh, your algorithm is not completely useless. Um, let's go through quick some examples that I encountered in the past about um, implementation uh, error or bugs that are hard to, to debug or, or to find. One example was, as I said, the broadcasting error in stable baseline two, uh, so in, in, in TensorFlow. And here it was suddenly failing. So at the end we had, the, we didn't reach the performance that we expect, but um, it was not failing completely. Another thing that is important for you to know is implementation of optimizer between library might not always be the same. So um, the RMS prop implementation of TensorFlow is slightly different from the PyTorch implementation. And as a result, implementing the same algorithm in the two different framework will result in, uh, in different results. And more recently, I was implementing DQN in JAX, so with SBX. And again, DQN was almost working, but not reaching the performance that I would expect. Um, and by looking at, at the Q values, I realized something was wrong uh, in there because it was not reaching the values that I would expect. And then I found out that the target network was not updated. And I got many more of those kind of problems uh, in, in the backup slides. So what can you do once you have a reliable implementation and fully tested? Then you can actually learn directly in the real world in, uh, in 10 minutes. And this is what I did also. I learned from scratch. Uh, so that's why you won't get the best result uh, using RL and directly in the real world. So after five minutes, it will learn to do a first step. And then after 10 minutes, it will reach kind of the maximum uh, performance. After four minutes, it does the first step and then quickly it will learn to walk. Um, and here, yeah, the optimization is done online and there's many gradient steps happening um, at every step uh, with a robot. And here you need really need to make sure that your implementation is correct. Otherwise, 
uh, you will spend hours on the robot uh, instead of minutes. The last thing I would like to talk about is a technique so I've been using more and more uh, recently, which is useful both for learning and other uh, many other cases, like thinking about how to simplify your code base. And the idea is over time, usually you have a code base that grows and grows and get quite complex. Um, but it's good from time to time to try to um, to implement a minimal implementation out of this complex code base. And why do I mean by minimal implementation? I usually mean to have something that is standalone with a minimal number of dependencies. So the best would be to have a single file implementation. And this implementation won't cover all the possible cases, but you need to cover the core uh, feature of your algorithm. And the idea is that that way you can reduce complexity and you can also think about your whole code base or what is needed and whatnot, and now you can simplify things. Um, but having also something that is standalone with minimal dependency, it make it also easier to share, also reproduce your experiment, because instead of running a code base with 10 or 100 of files, you have a single file, and that may make it also easier, easier for you to um, share your ideas, explain to others what you're doing, and also learn uh, about uh, the algorithm. So as an example, there's a clean array library, which is a set of single file implementation. And it's really great for learning about the different algorithm because we have a single file and then you can directly tinker uh, in there. This lower the um, uh, entry, the, the, th the threshold for newcomer, because they don't have to look into 10 different files to understand what is happening. You just have to look into one file. Of course, by doing that, you can also find some inconsistencies and bugs. And that's actually what happened to me. And I will show an example um, in the next slide. Um, and, and this will allow you to also improve back your complex code base. Uh, this minimal implementation, or if you do multiple minimal impl implementation, you kind of duplicate code. It's a bit hard to maintain, so it's maybe not the best on the mid term, long term. But it's a very good exercise so uh, for yourself, but also to share your ideas with others and to make it more reproducible. As an example, so I was recently searching for what is the simplest baseline for locomotion um, and comparing to reinforcement learning. And I wanted to share the idea that I had and check that um, it worked as intended, because usually you describe your method, but then you, you do some implementation uh, details and it doesn't really work as you wrote uh, in theory. So how does it look like? So I found out that just having simple oscillator at the joint level, so one oscillator per joint, was enough in a lot of cases for locomotion. And here, it's uh, the, the frequency between oscillator is shared uh, between all joints. And I had a medium code base, so five to 10 files that was um, avoiding to have some duplicated code. And I tried to condense that into only 13 lines of code. And by doing so, um, I actually found out some inconsistency and a potential bug in my code, and then I could fix it both in the single file implementation and back in the complex code base. And the idea of uh, this simple baseline was actually to showcase some shortcomings of reinforcement learning and show that we can do successful sim to real transfer if you have the right prior knowledge. I will compare so reinforced learning in simulation transfer to reality compared to the very simple open loop baseline uh, that is not using any randomization or reward engineering. And, and the reason of why it works is because it has the right uh, prior for, for learning. And yeah, if you apply RL, what it will do, it will learn the perfect uh, behavior in simulation, which is having a very high frequency uh, behavior. This allows you to actually hack the simulator and have a very high reward in, in there. But of course, it doesn't work on the real robot because the system acts as a low pass filter. And then you can do the same uh, with the open loop baseline. And because you have the right prior about locomotion, uh, it will work in simulation and in reality without any trick.
Finally, I would like to give you some links to very important resources if you do empirical reinforcement learning or just if you do actually any empirical science. One is a guide about empirical design for experiment, how to uh, design experiment to compare the algorithm, how to make it fair. Um, and it has a lot of uh, takeaways, nice takeaway which is written. And the other one is how to evaluate things properly, how to have um, to do better evaluation, do better science, um, and have, for instance, proper confidence uh, interval and compare different uh, algorithms. As an example, they recommend to use the interquartile mean, so IQM, instead of the mean for aggregating score. The idea is that you discard the top 25% and the bottom 25% and you uh, do the mean on the remaining 50% of your scores. And that way you can have something that is representative of your data, but that is also insensitive to outliers. Um, so let's conclude. So what have we seen so far for having reliable RL and reproducible experiments? So I've presented some tips that we use in Stable Baseline 3 for having reliable implementation. I've shown how with the zoo we log everything and make it uh, reproducible. Um, given you some tips on implementing new algorithm, how to minimize the time spent into uh, developing algorithm or how to minimize the time spent into um, uh, debugging things. And of course, no worry, I, I, I never get it right the first time, so it's, it's still hard uh, despite all the tricks. And I finish with a technique which is um, allow you to more easily share your ideas, but also allow you to learn about other ideas, which is having minimal implementation uh, of your code base. And of course, I highly recommend you to check out uh, the two links I've shown uh, previously uh, for best practices for um, experimental reinforcement learning and for better evaluation. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, that's the moment. So Anton, the question was on um, one of the slides, you presented two algorithms with two different implementations. Uh, they forgot which slide it was. Um, and they were wondering kind of what was the difference between the two implementations? And uh, I think it was for RMS prop. Yeah, PyTorch versus- Ah, uh, yeah, Pyster. okay, okay. Ah, yeah. Um, uh, yes, it's uh, here. Yeah, um, so the, the difference actually in uh, RMS prop, um, it's how they use again the epsilon value. So one is using it, uh, I think, inside the root square and the other one is uni using it outside the root square. Uh, we have some links for that uh, RMS prop. Yes. Uh, and, and basically, I think it's just, uh, yeah, if you can check out there, uh, I think the, the main difference is how they use the epsilon value in, in the optimizer. Um, actually, you have the same issue, I think, with Adam uh, between TensorFlow and, and, uh, and PyTorch. So there's some, some de the details are in there. So, yeah, so I have a similar question too, actually. So as we see in a lot of your examples, how you train in simulation and you transfer to your real robot, but how do you not make, how do you not break it when you transfer it to the real robot? Like how do you, are there, what guarantees you have there? Is that, yeah. Or like, how, yeah, how do you do that? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so, so, so one thing is most of the examples I've shown you, I, I don't transfer, I just train directly on the robot. Um, but then, of course, then you have the same problems. How do you not break the, your robot? So um, a, a lot of care need to be done in, in the um, experimental design. Uh, so defining an action space uh, in a way that whatever action you take, uh, you will not break your robot. That uh, usually uh, mean having a, some kind of safety layer around your RL algorithm. Um, the other uh, actually thing is that the robot I'm using, because of its elasticity, it has um, serial elastic actuator and very soft spring, it, it is very robust. Uh, so I know that uh, despite the RL doing very weird things like what we, we've seen here, um, I know that it should not uh, break it um, right away. But of course, uh, if, if you want to if you want to properly do it, you need to, to do some care. And one idea here would be to have some kind of low pass filter or use a bit um, a better exploration or penalize any um, high frequency action. Um, and, and, and so the, the answer is, is yes, of course, you, you need to 
um, to spend some time in experimental design and, and um, ensure that the, the safety of, uh, of your robot. Um, but in my case, as I said, I'm mostly trained uh, directly on real robots, so I, I know directly if it works or not. Yeah, so the question was regarding, you know, your minimal working example and how you uh, refactor your code. And the question is kind of, well, when do you choose to refactor your code? Because it can be a lot of work and kind of what, what does that design trade look like for you? Mm -hmm. um, so, so in my case, it was when I was writing the paper and wanting to make sure that before doing a massive experiment, um, checking that everything was right or... Um, at the moment, I, for instance, recently I asked my student to do it because I wanted to help uh, him, but the code base was too complex and, and that at the moment I, I asked him to, to do uh, that kind of refactoring. But it's, it's not fully refactoring here, it's you, you don't really change your code base, you just, out of your code base, you extract uh, some minimal implementation. Of course, by doing so, you can actually refactor later your code base. Uh, but the idea is more to, to extract uh, one algorithm and one feature of, of your code base and showcase it. So usually you do that when you want to check that everything is working as expected or want to share your code or want people to learn about it. Uh, that's, that's when I would do that. Okay. Um, we should probably move on to the next talk. Um, but that was a fantastic talk. Um, and we will, he provided some links, so we'll probably try and provide the slides uh, on the website afterwards so you can check out the links and everything like that. And he's, yeah, he's also on the panel, but yeah, we'll uh, thank him for his talk. <laughs>